Okay, welcome to the last of our micro lectures. We're going to just take a very, and I mean very quick look, at civil liability for the police, the courts, and the correction institutions. And I'm also going to touch a little bit on criminal liability here, because I think that's pretty important. Many students confuse those two things. So uh, we start off with uh, the famous quote from uh, Juvenal, who was a Roman, and, and basically, Quies custodia uh, ipso custodies, um, who will watch the watchman? How do you keep an eye on those that are keeping an eye on us? So there's a great deal of difficulty in establishing such systems. Um, the, the agencies that are supposed to detect crime, prosecute crime, and punish crime um, themselves are hesitant to allow anybody else um, to engage in those activities. So traditionally we had two routes. Uh, you can criminally prosecute those who break the law um, as part of the regular system, or you can sue them inside the civil court system. Now, to be honest, neither of those is particularly effective and have high rates of success. Um, so uh, quickly, a little bit of criminal li liability here. Criminal charges are very rarely brought against the police, prosecutors, judges, or prisons, prison officials. The fundamental problem is here, who's going to make this arrest? Typically, police won't arrest fellow officers unless compelled, and prosecutors won't ask courts to issue warrants for arrest, except in extreme cases where there's very clear evidence. Um, so, for example, no police officer I've ever seen uh, when a police shooting goes on, immediately puts the handcuffs on an officer and says, well, I consider this probable cause for an arrest and I'm going to arrest you. Usually we wait for an indictment. But you would never see that if a police officer saw an individual shooting another individual in the private sector. Uh, there would always be an arrest and charges might be dropped later, but the, the arrest would go forward. So civil liability is different. Civil liability they're easier to file. That's up to an individual. There's also a lower standard of proof. Uh, in a criminal case, you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt someone did something. In a civil case, you need only establish by a preponderance of the evidence. Now, it's inaccurate to say this, but the way you could think about it is proof beyond a reasonable doubt would be something like 99 or 95 to 1, you know? 99% uh, of evidence shows you did it, 1% shows you might not have. Well, that's beyond a reasonable doubt, 99 to 1. Uh, preponderance of the evidence, some people use the analogy 51-49. Do you have more evidence and better evidence to show that this occurred and that there is liability? Typically, however, even civil lawsuits tend to fail against the police. Uh, the rates can be, and the numbers are different depending on how you look at them, as high as 90% failure rates. Um, also remember that if you're suing someone civilly, uh, the police, the prosecution, or prison officials only face monetary loss, not incarceration. They're not going to jail. So some barriers to arrest or liability. All parts of the system enjoy either complete or partial immunity from being sued or prosecuted. So one of the questions you ask is, uh, what about the prosecution? Can you do something about a prosecutor who misbehaves. Well, you can't. They have near complete prosecutorial immunity from being charged criminally. Um, but civilly, they have some. Like the police, they have a qualified immunity. And it, it's very hard to get through this. The presumption is you can't sue them. And you're going to have to show me why you can. Now, also, very often people say, well, I don't want to just sue the police officer, I want to sue the institution. Institutions like the state of North Carolina can have immunity. Uh, this goes back to a doctrine called sovereign immunity, which says you cannot sue the state unless the state lets you. So most states, including North Carolina, have what's called a state torts claim act and sets out when you can sue, how you can sue. Um, Final point here is that do you want to go after the individual actor? In this case, I'm going to use the example of a cop. 
or do you want to go after a larger department, or a large organization like the police department? You could say the same thing. Do you want to go after an individual prosecutor or the district attorney's office? Do you want to go after an individual corrections officer or the whole prison? Individuals have limited resources. Organizations, if you win lawsuits against them, you can actually fix systemic problems. Now again, state law tends to limit lawsuits and prosecutions. And one of the things you frequently will see, particularly on the criminal side, and you should be aware of this, is that a prosecutor will say, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let the grand jury side. The, the Ferguson issue, where the Ferguson police officer was not indicted by a grand jury. Um, the prosecutor usually has the power to go ahead and get an indictment without a grand jury. So very often they don't want to do that politically against the police, so they will impanel a grand jury. Well, I think one of the things you should look at when this happens is ask this question. If it's not a police officer, how many times, what percentage of homicides brought in front of grand juries come back with true bills of indictment? And I think what you're going to see is you're going to see a very, very high percentage. Interestingly enough, remember, in, in front of a grand jury, you don't have to allow the defense to present evidence. You're just showing the grand jury the evidence in the best possible light to determine if there's enough grounds for an arrest. For cases where police are being prosecuted, I think you do tend to see that there's a lot of evidence to show that they didn't do it as presented to the grand jury. So you never get to trial. Now, federal legislation civilly is also available. Um, this is primarily 42 USC, which means US Code, Section 1983. It doesn't mean it was passed in 1983. This is actually the 1877 Anti-Ku Klux Klan Act. We teach a course on this in Wake Tech. It is a very complex area of legislation, very complex application of law. Uh, suffice it to say that it's not easy, again, to go forward civilly. Uh, all right, so that's going to be our last of our micro lectures. I hope you kind of enjoyed these, and uh, in the future I'll be doing more of them for different courses because I think they're pretty worthwhile. Hope you enjoyed the course.